All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, and when I mean when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Everybody. Uh, this is our first live streamed uh, MSSR 2020 lecture, um, and so. Uh, if you would like to send it along to other people uh, in the chat box, you can find the link that's right there and uh, that would link you to, to our MSSR channel on YouTube. Um, and that way we're trying to amplify the, uh, the message that's being given to, to everybody today and shared um, by our two wonderful speakers. And I'm very briefly going to do an introduction and then we can get around to the lectures and the, the Q&A. Um, just one moment here. So today we have two distinguished speakers with us, Keith Gesson and George Breslauer. And the topic for today's discussion is going to be US-Russian relations, policy formation, and expertise. Keith Gesson is a Russian-born American novelist, journalist, literary translator, and co-editor of N Plus One, which is a thrice yearly magazine of literature, politics, and culture based in New York City. He is also an assistant professor of journalism at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. In 2008, he was named a five under 35 honoree by the National Book Foundation. Gesson has written about Russia for the New Yorker, the London Review of Books, the Atlantic, and the New York Review of Books. And George Breslauer, received his BA and PhD from the University of Michigan. His interest areas include Soviet and post-Soviet Russian politics and foreign relations. He teaches courses on Soviet and post-Soviet politics and foreign policy. And in April, 1997, he was the recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award from the Division of Social Sciences. In July, 1998, he was appointed Chancellor's Professor at UC Berkeley for combining distinguished achievement at the highest level in research, teaching, and service. In August 1999, he was appointed Dean of the Social Sciences Division in the College of Letters and Science. And in July 2006, Professor Breslauer was appointed Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, the Chief Academic Officer of the Berkeley campus. So please give a warm welcome first to George Breslauer and then to Keith Gesson. Thank you so much. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be given this opportunity to speak to you on a topic that I'm interpreting really as to what extent knowledge was able to influence power. That is to say, did expertise on the USSR uh, get used in order to influence US policy? Now I'm gonna be covering the period of the 70s and 80s, and then Keith Gesson will, will cover the, the period since the 1980s. And, um, I think what I'd like to do is start by uh, specifying the terms here. I mean, what is the population in question that we're talking about? There are academic researchers in colleges, in universities, and in think tanks. There are specialists who are working in government. There are people with expertise on the, on the USSR, wherever they obtain that expertise, government, NGOs, international organizations, business, cultural organizations, uh, who they, they themselves may have the opportunity to influence policy. But what do we mean when we say influence policy? Uh, we could be talking about fundamental influence on the direction of policy, or we could, we could be talking more about the implementation of policy within the context of the direction that has been decided. Or we can be talking about direct influence or indirect influence. And then we could, we could be talking about input versus influence. Now, I, I would argue that uh, your conclusion about these, uh, about these questions of what kinds of specialists on the USSR might or might not have had influence on policy directly or indirectly, uh, much of this hinges not on the empirical record of individual's impact it hinges more on your image of how U.S. policy gets made. For example, U.S. policy, a legitimate and appropriate response to, uh, to legitimate fears of Soviet or Russian intentions and capabilities? Or is it 
By contrast, if you have a different image of the US policy process, is it a, a product of a need for an enemy? Or is it the product of the economic interests of what has been called the military industrial complex? Or is it a product of a crusading missionary streak in American foreign policy? So depending upon which of those propositions you might embrace, you're going to have a different answer to the question of whether Soviet logical or Russian specialization has an influence on policy. So let's look now at some cases of academic specialists who were appointed to influential positions in the 70s and 80s. Now under uh, Kissinger and Nixon, um, or Nixon and Kissinger during uh, Nixon's first term and then uh, until he resigned in 1974, my impression is that Russia specialists, whether inside or outside uh, of government, uh, Soviet specialists did not really have um, a decisive influence on the direction of policy because Nixon and Kissinger had already worked out in their minds, even before they entered office, uh, what the direction of policy was going to be. And that was uh, a, a trilateral detente among the United States, uh, China, and the Soviet Union. Uh, so I don't see uh, Sovietologists having had uh, a great deal of influence, if any, on the direction of policy. But if we turn to the Carter administration in the second half of the 1970s, Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Soviet specialist at Columbia University, who had met Jimmy Carter during the the deliberations of the Trilateral Commission uh, earlier in the decade was co-opted into the administration or appointed as National Security Advisor uh, during Jimmy Carter's one term in office. And Brzezinski's Columbia, um, Columbia colleague, Marshall Shulman, a specialist on Soviet foreign policy, was appointed key advisor or top advisor to Secretary of State Vance during the, uh, the initial years of the Carter administration. Then if we go to the Reagan administration, we see that the National Security Council specialist on the Soviet Union was, was brought in from Harvard University History Department, Richard Pipes uh, in 1981. Later in the decade under George H.W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice of Stanford University was co-opted into the National Security Council, as was Ed Hewitt, a so specialist on the Soviet economy, <clears throat> who was co-opted from the Brookings Institution into a key advisory role on, Soviet, on the Soviet economy in 1989 as well. There were government specialists who during the Reagan administration uh, had a direct influence on policy. Uh, Jack Matlock was, had a PhD in uh, Russian history. He was a uh, top Soviet um, uh, advisor on the National Security Council uh, from 1983 to 1987. And he was appointed ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1987 to 1991. Robert Gates, whose career has principally been in government, though with a short stint as president of Texas A&M University, had a PhD in Soviet studies and during the Reagan administration was deputy director and then director of the CIA. Well, what difference did these appointments make? Well, Brzezinski was a bureaucratic infighter uh, in the Carter administration and very good at it. And he typically outflanked uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance in getting both the ear of the president and uh, his preferences for how to deal with the Soviet Union during this period of decline of detente. Uh, he, he got his way uh, for the most part. And Marshall Shulman had very little influence on the direction of policy because Brzezinski had seized the initiative on that score. Uh, in the early years of the Reagan administration, uh, Richard Pipes was reinforcing Ronald Reagan's rhetoric uh, with a very hardline posture toward the Soviet Union. Uh, Jack Matlock, who was also in the, um, uh, in the government at the time, was more ambivalent about that. Uh, but when Richard Pipes went back to Harvard University, Jack Matlock uh, 
was appointed the top Soviet specialist in the National Security Council. And he was uh, an advocate of, uh, of looking for alternatives to the extreme hardline posture adopted in 1981-82. And this manifested itself more after 1983 uh, in that Matlock, when, <clears throat> when Gorbachev came to power uh, and made clear that he was going in new directions, Matlock was uh, advising the president to take this seriously, not to assume the worst. Whereas Gates, uh, deputy director of the CIA, was, uh, was, uh, was advising that this is not for real. Now, uh, these stories make for interesting history, but note that policymakers, the president and his cabinet, choose whom to appoint and whom to heed. There's great diversity of opinion among academic specialists. So the issue is not uh, whether specialists have uh, an influence on policy, but which specialists, because there was the, the uh, gamut of specialist opinion uh, at the time, both in the 70s and the 80s, uh, hardliners saying that the USSR was an irreconcilable antagonist, and others arguing that the USSR could be, uh, could be dealt with. Uh, one uh, high-level official in the Reagan Defense Department in the early years advised his colleague, don't talk to specialists, they only confuse you. Well, they co-opted specialists at that time that didn't confuse them until Gorbachev came to power. One type, however, that was never appointed to influential positions, and that was academic specialists whose scholarship and advocacy were along the lines of blame America first. That is to say, for example, in, in at attributing the origins of the Cold War to Stalin, the United States, or something else, they would typically blame the United States for that. And I, I would argue that when, when academic specialists are trying to have an impact on policy, they've got to always be aware of whether their prescriptions are within the bounds of political feasibility and whether they will be treated as politically, quote, responsible or not. Now, there were those with input, but rarely uh, with much influence. Uh, there were hundreds of CIA analysts specializing on the USSR, some of them from academia, Gray Hodnett, Paul Cox, Bob Blackwell, who was a classmate of mine getting his PhD at the University of Michigan when I was. Um, they may have input, but it's not clear that they have much influence unless they are simply being uh, used to reinforce what the top policymakers have decided needs to be done. Similarly, with academics writing papers for think tanks, uh, a real service to our society, Brookings Institution, AEI, Hudson, RAND, or government agencies, or giving presentations at conferences attended by government specialists or writing op-ed articles for newspapers, uh, they, they will typically have some input, but it's not at all clear that they'll have much influence. Uh, oftentimes, the commissioning of papers by government agencies asking academics to do a research project is part of a process of bureaucratic politics in which uh, insiders are looking for support from specialists for the particular position that they were uh, they were trying to advance behind the scenes. I gave talks at the State Department and CIA uh, during the Gorbachev era, uh, and I wrote a paper for the CIA that never used classified material, uh, giving my impressions of what the Gorbachev era really meant in its early years. Um, but I had no illusions that this was going to influence the direction of policy, and in fact, I really wasn't trying to do that. Uh, I'd like to give you two examples, though, wrap up with two examples, one from the American scene and one from the British scene that um, one I was participating in. In the spring of 1989, Secretary of State James Baker was about to go to Moscow for the first time, and his uh, head of policy planning, Dennis Ross, who himself uh, had written a dissertation at UC, doctoral dissertation at UCLA on Soviet politics, but then was used in government more on Middle Eastern politics. Um, Dennis Ross 
gathered three specialists on the USSR to brief Secretary of State Baker in the spring of 1989. I was one of those three specialists who was invited. Another was Stephen Meyer, uh, and the other was Stephen Sestanovich. And each of us gave, um, gave short presentations and then answered questions. Uh, my, it was interesting to me was that my presentation was about how Gorbachev was so skillfully seizing the initiative from potential or actual antagonists and um, uh, that I was really quite impressed by his ability to do that to both maintain and enhance his power as he seized the initiative. Uh, one person who was sitting in more as an observer was my former graduate school classmate Bob Blackwell who at this time was head of a division within the analytics side of the CIA and uh, during the Q&A, he raised his hand and made a comment, didn't ask the question. He said, uh, I agree that Gorbachev, and this was spring of 89, think about that. I agree that Gorbachev was quite skillful in seizing the initiative. I think that will last two more years and it will no longer be a feasible strategy for him. And sure enough, a little over two years later, we had the August coup against him. Uh, so I, I tip my hat to Bob Blackwell on that score. Uh, I learned from Archie Brown's recent book, The Human Factor, uh, Gorbachev, Reagan, and Thatcher, and the end of the Cold War, that Baker's response to our, our uh, presentations and discussion uh, was to write it off as academic theology. I thought back on what we had all said. I didn't think anyone was particularly dogmatic in their presentations, but I thought it was quite interesting that he wrote it off as academic theology. Now contrast that with a briefing that Margaret Thatcher solicited in September of 1983, as also recounted in Archie Brown's book, The Human Factor. Uh, this, was, this was a high point of tension in US-Soviet relations. The Korean airliner 007 had just been shot down by the Soviets. Uh, nonetheless, Thatcher gathered eight specialists on Soviet politics, history, Russian history, culture, economics, literature, foreign policy, and asked them to prepare short papers, six to eight pages in advance, to send them to her office. And she then read and annotated those papers. And when she gathered the specialists together, she asked them to give brief presentations summarizing their papers. Foreign office personnel, what we would call State Department personnel, were present, but were largely silenced. She didn't want to hear from them. She was looking for outside expertise that would, would perhaps expand her way of thinking about the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. She was never dismissive. She learned, and Archie Brown concludes that she actually changed her thinking as a result of this briefing. This is what he writes. Both the contemporary documents and the memoir literature make clear that the September 1983 seminar produced a shift of policy. The Prime Minister overcame some of her doubts and misgivings and was persuaded to embrace a policy of high-level dialogue with the Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe. Now, I don't believe, though I can't be certain, that such an open-ended discussion with a US president in the 1970s and 80s, and with such an impact on that president's thinking, occurred in the United States then, or perhaps even since. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Professor Bretflyer. And now we move to Keith Gesson. Hi, um, thank you for that, uh, Professor. And uh, this, this uh, thank, you, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, this presentation is a chronologically continuous, um, methodologically a little discontinuous, um, but I, I think uh, it will lead to some interesting uh, conversation in the Q&A. So, um, a, a little bit of background on this project that I'm still working on, and it's called the, the Russia Hands 
Um, so I began um, with, with kind of two questions. One was, you know, um, why did the U.S.-Russia relationship deteriorate um, between the end of the Cold War and, um, you know, the second uh, Putin era? Um, this is an image of Putin uh, giving his speech in 2018 uh, with his uh, super missile. Um, how did that happen? Um, and, and what was the role of uh, U.S. government Russia experts in either um, uh, making things worse or, or stopping them from being as bad as they might have been. Um, I started thinking about this in 2014. I was uh, working a lot in, uh, on Ukraine. Um, a, a little bit of background about myself. I was born in Russia. I came over uh, to the U.S. when I was six years old. I started going back to Russia as a journalist, uh, as a traveler, um, as a translator in the mid-90s. So I'd been going back to Russia a lot, traveled around the former Soviet Union. Uh, I was very interested in Ukraine. So when the Maidan uh, began, I was focused uh, 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 very closely on that. Um, and the Ukraine crisis happened in the context of uh, President Obama having made it pretty clear in the preceding several years that he was really kind of done with with Russia. He wanted to shift U.S. resources, U.S. thinking um, away from Russia, away from the region of the former Soviet Union and into Asia. Um, so then Maidan starts and um, I think this is January 2014, uh, Victoria Newland shows up um, in Kiev um, and hands out um, cookies and sandwiches uh, to the protesters um, in a, a pretty uh, sort of aggressive uh, show of, uh, of U.S. involvement, uh, which is immediately seized on by the Russians um, to show, to, to purportedly show that um, the entire Maidan was a kind of special operation uh, set up by the CIA. Um, for me, as a, somebody who'd been traveling to Russia and Ukraine for 20 years, uh, but ultimately uh, otherwise was based in New York, I was really surprised by this. Um, first of all, I had no idea who Victoria Newland was. Um, I thought um, she was at the time Assistant Secretary of State uh, for uh, Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, I thought, why is the Assistant Secretary of State seemingly a, a lowly position? Um, why is she contravening the stated uh, kind of policy priorities of uh, the President, Barack Obama, um, which had been to uh, get out of the region, basically? So, so how could this happen? Um, why is this happening? And, and who is Victoria Newland? Um, not to turn my um, ignorance into a kind of philosophical issue, um, but still, I, it, it made me wonder whether there was a kind of structural problem um, for foreign correspondents such as myself. Um, we were focused very much on Russia. Um, our travel, or, or, or you know, the former Soviet Union, our travel, um, in my case, was from New York to the former Soviet Union, back to New York, back to the former Soviet Union. Um, I knew very little about Washington, D.C. Um, I'd spent almost no time there. I didn't understand um, how the U.S. formulated policy uh, toward the region that I was covering. Um, conversely, uh, the people in D.C., the journalists in D.C. who uh, understood very well how the U.S. government functioned and had a lot of sources and a lot of experience with it, um, may not necessarily have understood very well what was going on in a place like Russia or Ukraine. Um, so there was a kind of disconnect where the people who knew what was happening um, in those uh, parts of the world did not know a lot about D.C., and the people who knew what was happening in D.C. did not know a lot about those parts of the world. Um, so. I, for, I started formulating these questions. Um, who are the Russia hands? What is their background? Uh, where do they come from? Uh, why do they think what they think? And are they all uh, like Victoria Newland? 
The answer turned out to be no, they're not. Um, my definition was slightly narrower than uh, Professor Breslauer's. Um, I, I, uh, I, I felt like I knew a lot about academics um, and I wanted to really focus on the people who were in DC. So I excluded academic specialists um, from my kind of pool of sources um, and, and uh, only talked to people who had um, uh, done some government service, whether in the State Department, National Security Council, Department of Defense, CIA, or Congress. Um, a lot of those were people who had uh, academic backgrounds and then had moved to DC uh, for one reason or another. Um, I was really quite surprised by the number of uh, foreign service officers and CIA analysts who had PhDs in, in Russian history or literature, I mean, it's, or politics. I mean, it seemed um, like everyone from the CIA that I talked to had a PhD. Um, and a lot of people in the foreign service. I started uh, to try to see if I could come up with some sort of general characteristics. Um, you know, was there a kind of identifiable um, genealogy of certain kinds of um, Russia hands that, you know, one could point to and, and uh, you know, know in advance uh, how they thought and what they thought? And the answer was no. A lot of people came out of Harvard, um, uh, Harvard Graduate School, uh, in the Department of Government, uh, Tom Graham, Sostanovich, Andrew Stent, Fiona Hill, um, who has been recently in the news. Um, but there, there, there wasn't necessarily an ideological effect. Um, Tom Graham um, is a kind of uh, a leading light of, of Russia hand realists. Sostanovich is, is more of a liberal internationalist. Um, uh, there, in the post uh, sort of Soviet era, um, a fair number of uh, specialists are, are have, in the U.S. have been from the former Soviet Union. Um, Eugene Rumer, Olga Olaker, Michael Kaufman, Dmitry Symes uh, from a previous generation. Um, on the whole, they seem to be a bit more um, kind of realistic or realist um, about uh, Russia, less hawkish, um, but there are plenty of exceptions. Um, uh, Lena Polikova is one. Um, uh, so, so knowing that someone uh, is, is from the Soviet Union does not really tell you that much about uh, their approach to the subject or their politics. Um, still, I did find it to be an interesting contrast with the Soviet period where if there were emigres um, sort of opining on Russian or Soviet politics, they would tend to be very anti-Soviet. Um, I, I tried to come up with some other kind of distinctions that might be useful in thinking about the Russia hands. Um, one of the frustrations of writing about, um, uh, about uh, these people who kind of spend their lives in DC is that they reject the um, kind of ordinary layperson's uh, dichotomy between Democrats and Republicans. Um, they really don't like thinking in those terms, um, partly I think because, you know, they need to be able to serve both Democrats and Republicans, um, but it's really quite deep in the sort of ethos or, or habitus of, of the way they go about things. One uh, longtime CIA analyst, he said to me, you know, I, you're not supposed to discuss it, and we don't discuss it. And there are people that I've known for decades um, that I consider close friends. I do not know their political affiliation, um, which, which I just found uh, really interesting, really strange, because you're in this, um, you know, quite binary world of Democrats and Republicans, and yet you do not identify uh, with, those, uh, with those parties. Um, it, made it made it sort of tough to pin them down in, in a certain way. Um, Realist versus liberal internationalist, I think, is a useful distinction. Um, although uh, actual kind of practitioners um, uh, uh, tend to be uncomfortable with the distinction, they, they want to have kind of more uh, flexibility. But but one does, uh, you know, if you study people's kind of opinions over time, you you can um, kind of slot them into these categories whether they like it or not. Um, Dubs versus hawks is a kind of um, somewhat useful distinction, uh, you know, how aggressive uh, do people, um, how aggressively do people react to uh, Russian actions, um, you know, in, for example, in the post-Soviet space, uh, do people want to uh, 
um, you know, threaten military action over um, the war in Georgia? Uh, do people want to send weapons to Ukraine? Um, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, Dubs versus Hawks is it does not at all um, uh, map onto the Democrat versus Republican distinction. There were a lot of Democrats um, in the debates uh, over Ukraine in, in 2014, 2015, who wanted to send weapons to Ukraine, and a lot of people on the Republican realist side who did not. Uh, Russia first versus captive nations is a, is a pretty useful uh, way of thinking about it. Um, the captive nations uh, is, a, is a word for um, a term that uh, is a Cold War term or probably an earlier term uh, for the nations of Eastern Europe who were under the Soviet, um, under Soviet dominance. Um, so people who had served in a place like Poland uh, or Czechoslovakia uh, would have emerged from those places and then in the post-Soviet period in a place like Ukraine or Georgia would have emerged from those places uh, quite sympathetic to the plight of uh, the Poles, the Czechs, uh, the Ukrainians, and the Georgians in a way that someone who had served exclusively in Russia uh, might not. Uh, so knowing whether someone had been, for example, an ambassador to Ukraine um, would tell you a fair amount about um, what their reaction was going to be like um, during something like the Ukraine crisis. One thing that um, one Russia hand uh, said to me, which I found intriguing, was he said, um, the kind of history of uh, debates within the US government um, is basically a repetition of the history uh, of the debates in the late 40s, early 1950s uh, between George Cannon and Paul Nitsa. Um, George Kennan, um, of course, was you know, one of the first Russia hands. He was the first director of policy planning in the State Department. Um, he was supplanted um, uh, by Nitsa, who um, you know, urged a more aggressive um, and confrontational stance toward the Soviet Union. Um, and you can really see this um, dynamic uh, play out kind of over and over again through the years where um, a more kind of conciliatory approach, um, uh, a more cautious approach um, is often sort of out-argued, out-maneuvered, um, you know, ultimately defeated by the more confrontational approach uh, within the U.S. government. Um, the exception, um, um, and, I, and, I, and I feel like Professor Breslauer, um, you know, had some of these kind of um, debates in his presentation, but, but perestroika seems to be a kind of exception to this rule where um, the conciliatory approach um, won out for a period. Um, in the post-90s era, I, I found myself uh, coming back over and over again to the debates between uh, Tom Graham, who many of you have already heard of, uh, from uh, this, this week and last week, uh, Tom Graham versus uh, Dan Fried and Victoria Newland. Um, inside the kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, political appointees, uh, directors of the National Security Council, they come and go, but uh, Tom Graham and uh, Dan Fried and Victoria Newland um, are forever, uh, at least in the kind of post-Soviet period. And, um, Tom Graham really represented a, uh, maybe a kind of Russia first approach, um, an approach uh, that really sought uh, more negotiation with Russia, more uh, room for the Russia perspective. Um, Dan Fried and Victoria Newland argued over and over again for a harder line, a more confrontational line uh, toward Russia. And um, over and over again, uh, Dan and Toria defeated Tom. Um, I think the reasons for this are very interesting, they're very complicated. I'm going to try to get into some of them uh, briefly in the rest of the presentation, but that's kind of the, uh, for me, that the Tom versus Dan and Toria rubric became um, quite powerful. Um, a few other quick distinctions that I, I found uh, interesting or, or fun. Um, Steven Sostanovich said, um, that it depends on how you come into Russia's studies. Uh, so the people who come in through literature, um, like Strobe Talbot, he thinks, uh, Sostanovich thinks, um, tend to become too uh, emotional about Russia and, and tend to experience a betrayal uh, 
of their hopes. Um, whereas people who come uh, to Russia through a sort of political science perspective um, tend to be more even keeled. I think there's something to that, um, although uh, not always the case. Um, professors versus foreign service officers at the very top of the kind of um, Russia hand game, uh, you tended to have uh, uh, academics who were pulled in as political appointees um, who would sometimes face off or work with um, people who had been at it for many, many years uh, inside the State Department as Foreign Service officers. So uh, Richard Pipe, Celeste Wallander, Michael McFall, Angela Stent are people who were pulled in um, from academia uh, versus the Foreign Service officers. Um, I couldn't really tell you that there's an ideological difference or a political difference or even a difference of approach. Um, I would say that uh, the Foreign Service officers, when push comes to shove, um, have been more effective simply because they they know more of the levers to pull within government. Um, knowledge of Russian versus no knowledge of Russian. Um, as I said, being from uh, the USSR um, does not really tell you um, how someone is going to think about uh, Russia, um, but not knowing Russia um, uh, does seem to have a kind of discernible ideological effect um, toward a more um, confrontational hawkish stance. Uh, toward Russia. Um, and and uh, there are, you know, kind of structural factors and historical factors for why uh, we have, you know, at this point, a fair number of people, uh, you know, who are involved in formulation of Russian policy who don't know Russian, don't know that much about Russia, which is pretty disturbing. Um, but uh, this may be changing. I hope it does change. Um, so, uh, just a quick kind of case study uh, about the role of ideas in um, the formulation of, of Russia policy at the highest levels. Um, from the inside, and you hear this over and over again from people who you know, served in the National Security Council in the White House, they say, um, you know, it's just a big scramble. It's one crisis after the other. So this is what one former Russia director said. He said, when you're in the White House, you have an embassy that walks into the front door of a foreign leader and says, we're thinking of doing this. And the foreign leader says, if you do that, I'm going to have a shit fit. That's what you base your foreign policy on, not some rambling essay someone at a think tank wrote. Um, so from the inside, it's contingency chance, one crisis after another. Um, and yet from the outside, one can discern a pretty clear pattern. And, and um, I like this quote from the kind of consummate insider, Bob Gates, um, he said, individual decisions based on the techniques. Somehow, those decisions taken together conveyed a political philosophy. So, uh, in, from the inside, it feels like just one, you're just careening from one crisis to another. Um, from the outside, I think we can make certain uh, determinations of, of what is motivating um, the seemingly spur of the moment um, reaction to those crises. Um, so, I, I really think a lot about NATO expansion. Um, I think it's had a, a tremendous effect on US-Russia relations in the post-Soviet period. Um, it is a super interesting case study because actually it wasn't a response to um, an unexpected crisis, but rather a kind of um, rare case where the US government really had a long time to think about it, um, to argue about it. Um, uh, in the early 1990s, people thought maybe NATO should be reconstituted, renamed, maybe disbanded entirely. Um, there was a long debate inside the government what to do about NATO. Um, and one of the really interesting things about NATO expansion is that people in, inside the Clinton administration, including Stroh Talbot, who was um, really not only the leading Russian hand, but, but for Bill Clinton, um, an old friend, his roommate at Oxford, um, and you know somebody he really trusted and admired, um, Strobe initially was against NATO expansion. Um, but what happened? Well, um, Rand did a uh, report um, building NATO, which argued um, for uh, the importance of expanding NATO uh, for the kind of um, expanding the security umbrella of NATO for the future of Europe. Um, this is what one of the co-authors said to me. He said, we talked to the Poles and they said, if you don't let us into NATO, we're getting nuclear weapons. We don't trust the Russians. Um, then we talked to the Germans. They said, the line of contact with the Russians runs through Warsaw. If you don't defend it, we will. 
we had a vision of a nuclear armed Poland being fortified by German troops facing off with the Russians. I don't think anyone wanted that. So, um, you know, a, a, a report seemed to me did not, they came to, to their conclusions. Honestly, they talked to people, this is the conclusion they came to. But then um, when they took it to the National Security Council and uh, Dan Freed was on the National Security Council, um, he was very excited to receive this report. And this is um, somewhat like uh, Professor Blesslauer's um, this was not a commission paper, but this was a, a paper that really came to be important in, um, in these bureaucratic politics. And Dan Freed receives the report, says, this is great, this is exactly what we've been thinking, but it's done in way more detail than we could have done here in government. Um, and the authors of the report, according to Dan Freed, were so relieved, I thought they were going to cry. Um, so um, Strobe Talbot changes his position, uh, writes a, um, a kind of seminal article uh, from New York Review of Books, arguing for NATO expansion. This is in 1985. Um, and a few years later, we have um, the accession of uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland into NATO. Um, you know, what other factors were involved in the decision? Well, um, one Russia hand, Olga Oliger, said, we didn't do it because we wanted to hurt them. We did it because we didn't give a shit if it hurt them. So um, in the 1990s, uh, even though, you know, we thought a lot about Russia, uh, we really wanted Russia to succeed, and yet, um, when push came to shove, um, we didn't care that much. Um, I was really struck by the importance of arguments in this instance. It was really an ideological debate. Um, and, you know, one of the striking things about talking to Dan Freed, who was a very long serving a uh, foreign service officer, uh, became assistant secretary of state uh, later under uh, George W. Bush. Um, he's a very passionate and convincing arguer uh, uh, who really marshals um, history very effectively. Uh, he's rhetorically very effective. Um, you can see how this person inside of a meeting about this stuff would just win a lot of arguments. Um, so this is kind of an example of the way you can imagine, um, you can kind of picture him doing this. He says, we looked at the Atlantic Charter. This is a uh, why we fought World War II document uh, written at the height of World War II. We actually had this discussion and we said, where does it say on here, footnote, this applies only to Western Europe, west of the line that Stalin draws. No, this applies to all of Europe and we're going to go for it. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, some people depict government as being driven exclusively by sort of power politics and inside intrigues, um, I found, at least in the minds of the people participating in it, they're having real substantive arguments about uh, beliefs and kind of core values. Um, and, you know, sometimes the person with the more convincing arguments simply wins. Um, that said, personality and experience matters. Um, this is a really nice description of uh, later arguments over Ukraine and why, uh, again, Dan Freed and Victoria Newland were so, were so effective in uh, pushing forth their arguments within the government. So this Russia hand said to me, uh, Dan and Tori have 60 years of government experience. They have all the contacts. They run the embassy in Moscow. They've been the boss of every one of the employees there at one point or another. They know all the Russians on the other end of the negotiations personally. They can get John McCain on the phone in a minute. They can get Fred Hyatt of the Washington Post on the phone. Before you even think of what to do, they boxed you into a policy and you're fucked. So, um, so it does matter who is advocating for a particular policy and how effective they are in gaining support both inside and outside of government. Um, bureaucratic organization um, matters. This is a point that Tom Graham made to me, a very interesting point. Uh, the way the NSC is structured, the way the State Department is structured is through a series of regional and functional bureaus. The question is always who leads the discussion. Russia was unique in that it's a country that was a factor at the time in the early aughts in almost all the major things the US government did but it wasn't in any place the most important factor. And so the Russia person never really took the lead. Um, and the Russia person at the time was, was Tom Graham. Um, and of course, you know, the US government doesn't have time to think of 
everything and, and, and to take everything into account. Um, so uh, William Hill, a long time uh, Russia hand, um, he worked uh, on, on uh, Moldova uh, for a period very intensely in the aughts. And he says, there are only 24 hours in a day. And even in a democracy, there are only so many people who can make a decision. So you take it to the deputy secretary, or undersecretary, and they say, I don't have time for this shit. And so you decide you'll do it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, or maybe next week, or maybe never. Um, so it's also just kind of a matter of, of how much time the people above you have. Um, this is my last slide. So, uh, you know, ultimately I came to this question of, um, you know, as Professor Breslauer said, uh, within the academy, which is, and, and within even the journalistic world, but especially within the academy, which is um, a world that I'm, I'm very intimate with, uh, the, 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 the spectrum of opinion is really broad. You have all sorts of opinions. Um, the spectrum of opinion, by contrast, in Washington, D.C., is not so broad. It's quite narrow. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, you know, I was doing interviews, this was last summer, uh, when, when Bernie was still a viable candidate. And um, I was quite shocked to see that even the Bernie campaign was quite hawkish on Russia. Right. Um, and so, so for me, as a person who has particular views, I have, I am a blame America first uh, person. Um, I, and I, I am that way because I think the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world. Um, and also I am an American. So for me, that perspective is very important. And I think um, I would love for it to be represented, um, you know, uh, by Russia hands in the higher reaches of US government. So, so how do we break the cycle of, um, of this kind of pretty hawkish, pretty confrontational um, consensus on Russia inside the US government? I don't know the answer. Um, there's a structural problem. Um, uh, Michael Kimmage, who's convened this seminar, um, he, he said an interesting thing. There's a kind of undergraduate who gravitates toward foreign policy. They are socially and culturally liberal, while at the same time believers, perhaps by definition, in the virtues of American power. Um, how do we get people um, to move to DC um, and work in government um, and work in the foreign policy of the U.S. government who do not automatically think that um, the U.S. can solve every crisis um, and that the U.S. is uh, automatically a kind of um, beneficent force um, in international affairs. That's not necessarily, the, that's the sort of person that goes into academia, um, but it would be great if more of those people actually went into government. Um, it's also a problem of ideas. Uh, on the right, uh, there's been a kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of edge of um, Republican uh, thinking is, is realist thinking. Um, so Brent Scowcroft, um, Tom Graham um, are, are kind of avatars of this. On the left, the furthest that you have in government is um, the tradition of humanitarian intervention of which Samantha Power um, is a kind of leading exponent. And you can really see this in the Ben Rhodes memoir. Um, it's very interesting. They really, um, Rhodes, uh, Barack Obama, really wanted a kind of new and, and different kind of policy toward Russia. And the, the furthest left, the most idealistically that they could think was um, this kind of policy of human rights and humanitarian intervention uh, which to my, my mind has, has run its course and, and really has proved um, you know, not to be the most progressive uh, policy for the US in the world. So can we think further left than that? Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, um, I, I take a certain kind of, a certain sort of, a sort of solace uh, from the fact that there are these um, uh, uh, right-wingers who move to DC who hate government and want to dismantle uh, the government, uh, uh, might there be a kind of uh, foreign policy hand uh, or Russia hand of the left who uh, will want to move to DC and dismantle the empire? Um, you know, might this person even be at the seminar? Um, and uh, those are, those are, that's my presentation and I, I look forward to discussing more.